Thank you. It's uh, really wonderful to be back in Montreal in front of a live audience. Can you guys believe it? It feels surreal. It also feels wonderful. It also feels normal how things should be and hopefully will be from now on. Um, it's great to be in Montreal also because, if, if you know, we've been here a couple of times before and every time we feel such great energy from you guys and from your beautiful city. So thank you for joining us tonight and thank you also to everyone joining us online. This year feels special for us at Side Effects. First is the fact that we can host an event this way. Uh, but secondly, our company has turned 35. It's a very young 35, mind you. Uh, we have the same culture that we started with, very embracing, very relaxed. We're very focused still, always, on VFX. Um, we do what we love to do. And um, hopefully every release that we put out there is an expression of our company as well an expression of what you need. So it's really wonderful to give you 19.5. This is happening nine, year, nine, nine months, only nine months after the release of Houdini 19. Um, that's pretty quick and I'll explain how this came to be. Uh, actually a lot has happened since we released Houdini 19 a couple of months ago. We um, put out a lot of training material. We hosted Hive events. We grew our staff. But what about the product? So for the product, our self-mandate for this death cycle was to cool our jets a bit. We've been going at top speed for what seems like a decade now, always putting out lots of new features and frameworks and architecture. So it felt like the right time to have a release where we just focus on quality of life improvement. So that's the theme for Houdini 19.5. And that's why we were able to take a shorter time to bring it to you. So it's all about workflow enhancements. It's about better performance on CPU, GPU. It's about general polish. But it's not a maintenance release. I mean, it may have been okay to start that way, uh, nothing wrong with that once in a while, but we couldn't help ourselves. Yes, we left all the big architectural stuff for Houdini 20. That's still coming. But we've done a lot feature-wise in this release also. First, we've, we've completed some important development arcs. As you'll see, we brought in all the, all the dynamic solvers now into SOPs, which is a big deal. This was a big goal for us a couple of years ago. Uh, we've completed, completed, quote unquote, hair grooming and so on. And then we've advanced Solaris and modeling and pyro and lots more. And I can't say enough about those Karma renders. Just wait till you see that Karma XPU. Just wait till you see it. Anyway, I've talked enough. Let's begin uh, to lead us uh, further through this presentation. I'd like to invite my two friends and colleagues, Rob Stauffer, and Scott Keating. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Kristen. So it wasn't that long ago that we introduced you all to Solaris. It was our lighting, look dev, and layout tool set within uh, Houdini. And since then, Solaris has matured quite a bit. In fact, I'm happy to say that lots of studios have started to adopt Solaris in their pipelines and have been using them on productions all over the world. It's matured quite a bit. We introduced some new brush tools in Houdini 19 and with 19.5 we've enhanced those brush tools and we've even made it even easier for you to make your own brushes. We've added render region support, we've added things like subsurface scattering to Karma XPU, We've also worked hard at encapsulating a lot of the mysteries and intricacies of USD to make it easier to understand. A new scene import node that makes it easier to bring in things from the rest of Houdini so you can take advantage of Solaris lighting and rendering, as well as even utility nodes like a motion blur lop to make it a little bit easier to deal with motion blur. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott to take you through some of those features. All right. 
Thanks, Rob. Um, so let's just do it. Let's dive right in. So we're going to start out with some brushes, but before that, we're going to start with the render region. So the render region, I mean, this is something people obviously want. Um, with Solaris, the whole viewport is kind of a live IPR render, um, but it's still useful to be able to zero in on something, you know, just render in the area you're interested in, especially when you're doing something like this. So here we've got our, one of our new brushes, which is kind of like a, a spray paint brush, a scatter brush, something that allows you to paint lots and lots of assets really quickly, you know, give them nice orientations and so on. We can also use a nudge brush to kind of tweak their positions over time. And really this is just meant to sort of speed up um, your workflow a, a little bit, let you place a lot of things quickly. And again, that render region to dive in and start rendering little pieces of your scene, just verifying, you know, what the viewport and the render are going to give you uh, in the end. So what we're going to do now is try out another little brush. But before we do that, um, we're going to talk about how, you know, these assets that we're using um, can be stored in these different libraries. So here we're loading up these wood assets. So this lets you sort of categorize your assets and load them up when you need them. So wood or rock or, or plants or whatever and keep them in separate libraries rather than one massive library. Um, and in this case we're using a new brush called the stack brush. Um, and this basically does <laughs> exactly what it says it does. It stacks things on top of each other. You can see these planks um, being stacked up. We sort of randomize which assets are being pulled from. Uh, we align things to the, to the ground plane or whatever you're colliding with and so on. Um, you know, but it can sort of give a slightly unnatural result, obviously. So this is almost like a, a brush that starts and then you use things like the nudge brush to sort of move them into a more natural position. I mean, obviously, sometimes you actually do want to stack. Of course, you could use physics as well to do the same um, sort of thing if you would like to. Um, again, none of these are groundbreaking things. They're just like they make your life a little easier as you're doing common tasks for these types of um, layouts. <clears throat> um, and again, of course, the sort of benefit of working in Solaris is you get this ability to go directly to your render, see exactly what you're doing as you're doing it. Um, so here we're just going to do a quick little wipe using um, our render gallery. So here, you know, we've just had the before and after. Again, nothing, nothing groundbreaking, but it's just a really convenient fact that as you're working and as you're storing these variations, they show up here in your render gallery. You can compare them like, did that work? Did I actually make it worse? Maybe I want to revert my scene. So all these tools are starting to become mature enough that you can really get into sort of a, a, a groove and feel like you're working um, quickly and getting the results that you're looking for. Um, another brush here is a line brush. And if you've ever built anything in SOPS before, this might have even been one of the very first things you've ever built, which is essentially a line with instances copied along that line. Um, so this is a really useful tool, especially for things like this, like architecture, you know, things that are sort of static like this. Again, just letting you lay things out really rapidly without having to place everything one at a time. But it's also a pretty good indication of how you would build a brush like this. So in our new brush system, you can easily build nodes like this. And if you've built a tool that copies a bunch of things to align in SOPs, you're about 70% of the way of building your own brush because inside this brush is just a SOP network that does essentially the same thing. And we'll jump to a quick little render as well just to verify how things uh, are looking here. So it's not just things like this though. There's also brand new, brand new tools like light filters. So light filters are filters on lights um, and they act kind of like what you would expect real life light filters to do. So in this example we have these three nodes. These are our base sort of filtering nodes. They're material X nodes. And in this case it's a gel and it acts just like a gel in real life. It affects the color, the exposure, typical things that you might put literally in front of a light in the real world. We also have a gobo light filter and this allows you to project things through the light. And you might be saying like, well, I've been able to do this before. We've had lights that could do these kinds of things and that's absolutely true. What light filters gives you is the ability to build these little networks to control multiple lights. So if you want to put a, bring down all of the lights in your scene one stop, you can just apply a light filter to it. Here's an example. We have the barn door filter, which acts very much like the barn doors we have on some of our default lights. But again, if somebody hands you a scene with a whole bunch of lights in it and they don't have barn doors, you can apply this light filter, apply barn door lights to them. 
And the great thing is you can combine them all together. So you can see that I enabled all three of the shaders and now I've got the gel, the burn door, and the projection, the go ball working all at the same time. And when you work with these default nodes, these, these sort of base light filters, both XPU and Karma CPU will render the effects as you can see. We switch back and forth. But on Karma CPU, you can actually build Material X networks. So it's not just these base nodes. So we're going to start out with a pretty standard sort of gobo. It's just a texture map of some trees that are getting projected through this window. And now we're going to add a gel. So the first thing we're going to do is maybe make it sort of a moonlight kind of a scene. Then we're going to build a little network to modify some of the light coming through the window. So a lot of times when you have like uh, you know things outside the window, there's big things that cast shadows, and then there's little things that affect the light, but you don't really see them as shadows cast on the ground. You just kind of feel like a, a difference in the overall lighting. So we're just going to use these Material X nodes to create basically some noise, and you can see we're using this to affect not necessarily the color, but just the exposure. And when we combine those things, now we've broken it up even more than the Gobo did originally. Probably too extreme, so we bring it down a bit. And now you get that sort of dappled light that happens when light goes through leaves and things like that. So these light filters are really powerful ways of modifying your scene um, in a sort of a procedural way. And again, of course, these can be wrapped up and used on any lights that you would like. So let's take a look at another example here, pretty classic sort of projection onto a screen. Um, so we're going to use this network to do a couple of things. First of all, we're going to use it to blur our image. But then we're going to drive that with a ramp. And so this is just using the projected UVs to do kind of a radial ramp. And we're kind of emulating maybe like an old lens or something like that, something where it gets blurry around the edges. And again, of course, you could have generated a texture map and done this, but then you had to go and generate a texture map every time you want to get this kind of result. The nice thing about this network is that it's editable in this live sort of way. Here we're just tinting that same sort of blurriness with another color. Again, this kind of almost make a feeling of like, again, an old dirty lens or something like that. You can tweak the blurriness and now you've built a nice little um, tool that, again, you can apply to any of these projected textures that you might want. Um, but like I said, it's not just a light thing, it's multiple lights. So here we've just got a bunch of lights lined up against this grid, and we're going to build a little network that just filters the light based on the distance to where it's hitting. Um, in this case, we're going to use these ramps um, that are technically part of Material X, but also developed by us to give that power to you, the users, because Material X doesn't actually have ramps. Um, so we're sort of filling in the gaps here and providing those tools. But you can see, we can change these lights by modifying this network in a pretty simple kind of way. And then here's just a, a sort of a fully rendered example using all the techniques that we just talked. Now this is sort of more subtle than the examples we gave, but you can see the kind of dappled light on the desk, the projection texture of the map there. So again, all these tools come together just to give lighters or anybody who's building a scene like that just a little bit of extra time to sort of tweak lights even more than just the standard lights. Uh, it's especially important if a setup is handed to you and then you need to modify those lights en masse. And just as a quick aside, we've also added something called the dash box. Um, so the dash box is this new sort of pop-up that you see here. And when you trigger it, you basically are searching all parts of Houdini. So in this case, I just searched for motion blur and one of the hits was our new motion blur lop. But the dash box is truly sort of a global search. So for instance, I can do like, I want to find the geometry spreadsheet pane and it'll jump me directly to the geometry spreadsheet pane. I can jump back to the scene viewer just by doing the same thing. And you know, navigation is sort of a, a light version of this. You know, it's probably easier to click the tab, but sometimes you have a lot of them. But you can also use the hashtag path there to search for nodes, node paths. In this case, we found the karma lop. Then we're going to do a hashtag perm and say, well, now that I found the caramel op, show me the resolution. And you'll see that it jumps me directly to the parameter and lets me begin altering it immediately. The same thing can be true of display options, just as another example. So if we search for depth of field, it jumps me to the display properties, to the place where the property exists, and even sort of flashes a little line there to tell you where it is. So it makes it a lot easier to find things. Houdini is a very big piece of software. There are a lot of preferences and display options. You know, sometimes people watch our presentations and they're like, where is that thing that they talked about? So the dash box gives you a really fast way to do it. 
And keep in mind that this is just step one. So the dash box currently is a global search, but with a little imagination, you can imagine where you can go in the future. Like, why not just toggle on and off that display property directly from the dash box? You know, why not show help directly in that scene? Right? That, that gets you faster to the information you want and lets you make those changes quickly. So it's a search, but it's potentially sort of a global control panel for Houdini coming down the road. That's a bit of an aside. Let's get back to, uh, to rendering here. So Material X, um, we're continuing to add nodes to make you have more functionality available to you out of the box. You can see this KMA on the, uh, the node there. That stands for Karma. And that means this particular Material X node is for Karma only because Material X does not have um, a curvature node. But so we don't want to just say you can't use curvature because it's important to have it. So we're developing those and as fixes or uh, the gaps are filled in Material X, we'll replace our nodes with those so that it matches the standard. And you can see really nice sort of effects, just mixing materials given this sort of copper patina look. Um, here's another one, facing ratio, another, another useful um, shading operator here now in, uh, in Material X. And uh, sometimes people ask us, like, why Material X? You have VAX, you have VOPS, like, why do we need this other thing? And there's a couple of reasons. One uh, is that, um, you know, there's the potential of interoperability between other renderers. That's pretty important. But there's also just the fact that XPU will never run VEX shaders. It's not possible to do it. So we want to have one language that both renderers can use, and this gives us an avenue toward that. And of course, Material X has a lot of robust shading in it, so you can use it pretty much the way you use VEX. It's a little limited at the moment. It's a little bare bones, but we plan on shoring it up over time, just like we're doing here. Here's another really popular feature that was in the principal shader in the old VOPS world, which is rounded edge. Um, if you're not familiar, this sort of lets you take um, sharp edges on geometry and do sort of an at render time rounding, essentially of the normals, to make it feel like you know, you've put a bevel there when you haven't. Really nice for things like concept art, where you're not really concerned about um, topology, you just need things you know, in the right position and the right shape. So that gives you this really nice ability. You can see that bottom edge there becoming really rounded um, as we apply the shader. Um, another really important advancement that we've made is that is something that we used to call coving in, in Mantra. And this is where, you know, you have a surface, let's say the corner of a box, and you're doing displacements, and, you know, the top goes up and the side goes sideways, and sometimes you can tear the geometry apart, right, because your displacements are going in different directions. Um, so we've solved that now in Karma. Mantra had a solution to it, and now Karma does as well. So you can properly displace things without any worry of seams or cracks in your geometry, which is something that can happen um, when you have sort of extreme displacements. Here's just a closer up version just to show that, that edge there, and you don't see any of the, the gaps or spacing you might expect. Another thing is ocean rendering. So there was no reason you couldn't render oceans previously, but it was sort of a complex process to bring all the stuff in the lops and get things ready. So what we wanted to do is create a uh, Karma Ocean Lop. So this basically does all the work for you. You can work on your um, ocean in SOPs just as you normally would, and then this one node will pull in all the data and let you sort of render uh, with it kind of immediately. And this is really nice because it puts this tool kind of in the hands of look dev or layout people, right? Like if you were like, oh, it'd be great if out that window there was an ocean, now you can just drop down this up, make a quick ocean. Maybe an effects artist or somebody's going to come along later and actually put in a nicer ocean, but it gets you up and running. You can render, you can do your look dev and see it all live. So this is part of what we're talking about when we're talking about like quality of life. It's about like getting everybody closer to what they need to do as quickly as possible. And here's just the, the karma render of that ocean, which is not playing for some reason. Let me see if I can go back and get it to play. Oh, there we go. Um, again, this is like a, I think an eight kilometer by eight kilometer patch of ocean. It's using all the tools you're familiar with, the various spectra, blending them together to hide the tiling, all the things you need for an ocean, um, including the particle pass and so on. So we're really there with, with the full tool set now available to you in LOPS without too much trouble. Okay, so Karma XPU, and you can see that little alpha tag there, and we're happy to say today that it's in beta now instead of alpha. So, <laughs> um, so you, might, you might be wondering, okay, well, why not, you know, 
Why not a full Karma XPU release? Like, what's holding us back? Um, and the answer is not, not a lot. There's just some really production quality features that we haven't quite hit yet. And we don't want to say it's a full uh, version until we do that. And just to give you some examples, one was XPU you know, didn't render subsurface set scattering um, in the last version. Now it does. This is using the Material X um, uh, standard surface here to do the shading. You can see the nice uh, subsurface scattering in the ears, you know, the typical place you would see it on a character. And just here on the left is Karma XPU, and you can, or CPU, sorry. Um, and you can see they're, they're pretty similar. They're not exact, but they're similar, um, which is kind of our, our goal. Motion blur was another thing that tripped people up a lot in Solaris. So we've created a motion blur LOP, which basically handles the caching, the setting of properties, and all those things for you. Again, trying to, to, to smooth out those rough edges for people who maybe don't know the intricacies of that kind of render pipeline. So here we have Car CPU, you know, this, our hairless capybara here um, walking around. You can see the motion blur, of course, the SSS. Um, and uh, the same is true of XPU. And you can see, again, how similar they are. But there are some subtle differences. Um, and I will mention that there probably will always be some subtle differences, because Karma CPU and Karma XPU are completely different renderers. You know, they share a name. They share the shading language. Um, but there will always be some difference, because they're technically not actually the same renderer at all. Our goal is to keep them as close as possible. Um, but there will always be some drift. However, if you're rendering with XPU, and you use the CPU version of XPU, which I know is a little confusing, that will always match the GPU version. So the CPU version of XPU will always match the GPU version. They are the same engine. It might be a little slower, but it will give you the same result, which is nice if you ever need to fall back for memory reasons or so on. So here's just a quick example. You might even remember this from the last launch um, if you watched it. And this is like a little demo scene um, that we had some people build as kind of a fake commercial. And we basically asked them, hey, can you just re-render that in 19.5 and tell us you know, what the results are, what's different, try it in XPU. And you know, we got some really nice feedback. So you can see in the upper right corner there, you know, two minutes approximately, two and a half minutes for the XPU frame that you see there. Um, but a, a nice sort of benefit was also that CPU itself was, was faster. So we're constantly, again, we're making those improvements, trying to speed up all of these things. We're not just relying entirely on XPU to be the fast version of Karma. We want everything to be as fast as possible, especially because the reality is, at least for the next couple of years, maybe not three or four, but at least one or two, uh, you know, not everything can fit on your GPU. You know, if you're rendering huge effects, you know, you're looking at 100 gigs of RAM, not you know, 16 gigs of RAM. So uh, there's always going to be a place for these kind of renderers, at least in the near future. Um, here now is just the, the video playing, just to give you an idea that even though we're saying XPU is in beta, um, you know, you can render scenes with it. It's absolutely a, a capable renderer, a fast renderer, something that will give you really good results. Um, like I said, we're holding it back just because we don't feel fully comfortable that we've hit all those like high level, or I should say low level production quality issues here. But certainly for most scenes, general scenes, you can absolutely use XPU. So now we're going to move on to KinEffects, and I'm just going to uh, invite Rob back up on the stage uh, to do a little intro. Hey, thanks, <laughs> So uh, that's 19.5 uh, dot release, and all that is in Solaris, which I think is pretty amazing. Lots of great stuff in there. Um, Material X, like Scott went over a lot of Material X networks and nodes. Uh, we are committed to making sure that Karma uh, Material X is fully supported by Karma. Um, speaking of Karma, Karma XBU, it's looking amazing, I think. And if all goes well, we're hoping that early next year, early to mid next year, that we can take off that beta tag and make it Karma XPU gold. So let's hope. Um, so up next, we're going to talk about character and character effects and creature work. Um, we're going to start with kin effects. Um, but overall, this has been sort of a midpoint release for a lot of this stuff. Um, we've added more mocap controls, better uh, filtering for imported data. Uh, the crowd's got a little bit of a boost with a new look at system that Scott's going to take you through. Um, grooming continues to improve or grow as a complete tool set. Um, we have, um, we have uh, mirrored brushing and combing with support for asymmetrical grooms. 
uh, which is really nice. So yeah, we have a lot of good stuff there, and uh, Scott's going to take you through. All right, thanks, Rob. Um, right, so KinFX. And we've included our crowd tools in KinFX uh, in this particular presentation. I mean, they're technically separate things, but the reality is the crowd tools ingest KinFX rigs. So they're kind of the same system, even though they kind of overlap in certain ways. So let's take a look um, first on some, some filtering that we're going to do. So this is a way of taking some motion, you know, typical motion that you've brought in, and smoothing the data out. So this is something that happens quite a lot. You get some sort of noisy data and you want to smooth it out. Um, and so this uh, smooth motion SOP basically lets you do that. It's a dedicated node to smoothing motion, as it says. Um, of course, we took it a little further. You can include attributes in there. So it's not just the transforms. It's any attributes that are on the points can be smooth. Color would be an obvious one here. And I want to point out that we're using the Butterworth filter, which if any of you are character effects people or character rigging people, you'll probably know the Butterworth filter. It's sort of a very popular filter people like for doing this kind of smoothing. But let's just take a look at sort of a more obvious example here. So we've got this character on the left. That's just some mocap that was brought in. And it has, you know, the pretty standard problem you'll get with mocap, which is, which is sort of jitter, either called by, uh, caused by maybe a low quality capture. Uh, maybe it's been compressed. There's all sorts of reasons you get that kind of jitter. Maybe he stepped behind something that couldn't be tracked. There's lots of reasons. On the right, we're using this Butterworth Smooth filter to basically cut out the high frequency noise. So you can see, especially on the toes there, that we've mostly removed that, right? Of course, it works with low frequency as well. Um, now here, we've made a very exaggerated version of the smoothing, just to show you that you can smooth the bulk motion as well. Um, but obviously, you start getting drifting and sliding and things like that. So the best option is to use all the KinFX tools that are already available to you to sort of blend these two rigs together. You know, maybe I want a low frequency smooth on the shoulders and neck. Maybe I want a high frequency smooth on the feet and hands or something like that. So you can really mix these things together and smooth it out, along with all the other tools we have for locking the feet or stabilizing joints and so on. And speaking of that, here's a, a fun example um, that one of the, or our animator, I should say, one, we have one, <laughs> uh, animators at side effects, uh, who's took on this sort of like little experiment for himself, which is basically to, you know, keyframe some animation, this sort of complex action of doing the monkey bars, and then using a bunch of the tools to add either simulation or secondary motion to them. So basically on the left, you have the, the full keyframed animation. As you move over to the right, basically the lower half of the body has some ragdoll animation on it. Uh, then the red has the secondary animation and cleanup. And by cleanup, we actually mean the smoothing filter, for instance, just to remove any of the jitter you can get from a, a ragdoll sim. And then finally, the green layer is final animator tweaks on top of that. So that's basically an animation layer on top of the ragdoll and the cleanup, allowing you to, to, to make small fixes. And that's just because the reality is, you know, adding a physical simulation into your animation tool set does give you the benefit of sort of realism. Um, but the downfall is that sometimes reality is kind of ugly and you want to fix it. <laughs> uh, so, you know, using these layers lets you do that. In this case, you can see there was some awkward tangling of the legs in one of the passes. You just add an animation layer on top and fix those passes. So, so physics becomes just another tool in the animator's toolbox to get them to their result faster. It's not really taking away anything. It's just giving them another tool like motion paths. Um, and so this is the network that Warren built um, for his setup here. And just to quickly walk through it, you know, at the top is basically do your animation. Apply your ragdoll simulation, do the smoothing and so on, and then tweak the results. So something interesting here is that, you know, you can see by this network that this isn't necessarily a linear process, right? What, what happens is, is this network kind of becomes an animation scratch pad where you're like, oh, I'm going to do this bit of animation here. How does it look if I add some physics on it? What if I tweak the animation this way? And instead of like saving multiple versions of your hip file or any of those things, you just sort of branch off. And then maybe you decide like, oh, I'd like the arms from this part, but I like the feet from that part. And so you begin blending those things together, right? So it takes all of your work and just lays it all in front of you and says, well, how do you want to assemble this back into your full animation? 
So just show you again, just so you now you have sort of an idea of what's going on. And it's pretty cool as you go left to right. You know, there's places there where, you know, things look interesting, but, you know, maybe a little too out of control. And by the end, as we get to the green layer, we have a sort of a nice, pretty believable um, simulation slash animation of somebody traversing some monkey bars. Um, but of course, it's not just about the character. So here's another example Warren did where he wanted to have some rigid bodies um, interacting with the characters, right? So this is a pretty common issue with animation, right? It's not done in, in uh, uh, isolation. It has to interact with other elements um, in your scene. But typically what would happen here is an animator would animate probably with no physics at all, just like a, a rigged table or something like that. Then they would do a pass and hand it to an effects artist who would take that and try to simulate it. And then the animator would say, oh, it's a bit too fast. Maybe he should grab the table here. Maybe he should do this. Um, and it creates this long feedback loop where it has to go to effects and back and effects and back. What's really nice here is that Warren did all of this. So this was all built in his animation network. He set up the rigid bodies. He set up all these tools. He did the fracturing. And it's not that this would be used in the final result. I mean, certainly an effects artist is going to go and add dust and debris and probably tweak a lot of things, make the shattering more interesting. But what it gives him is the ability to actually interact directly with the simulation, see the results, and immediately start tweaking it, rather than, again, going through this long feedback loop that can happen. So again, everybody ends up kind of doing the same job, um, but it's passed off in very tight circles instead of these long paths. Um, here's just an example of, of our uh, capybara friend. He's got fur. We gave him some dignity now and put fur on him. Um, uh, and here we're just using the retargeting tools. So we take that same animation that we did before, um, but we've applied it to this capybara rig. Um, so this is another really useful point, is that an animator can actually start working immediately, <laughs> you know, before they even necessarily have the final rig, and just use all the kit effects tools to say, again, oh, I've got a new rig, fine, I'll do a little retargeting here, I'll do an animation layer there, I'll bring all this stuff together. And in this case, for instance, you know, the capybara's <laughs> arms and hands are very different uh, than that stick figure, and so we had to use joint locking and things like that to actually lock the hands to the handlebars. So again, this is a layering process. Animators layering on physics, layering on retargeting, working up to a final result to give the best. Now, of course, this could be taken much further than this. There's some, you know, there's definitely some oddities. Apparently, he falls at the end, so maybe he should do that again. Um, but uh, it's just a, an idea of like how far you can go with these workflows all the way to a, basically a completely different character. And that kind of leads us into character effects. So we're going to start out with crowds. And this is the look at that Rob mentioned earlier. So first of all, we had a look at tool in our crowd systems previously. Um, but it was pretty limited. And it was limited in a bunch of ways, one of them being there was really only one target you could use. There wasn't that much control over how the look -ats were performed. But here we've really pulled that apart now and had tons of options. So in this case, the blue robots have a 20 degree field of view. The orange have a 70 degree. And you can see that basically the blue ones only look at things directly in front of their faces. They don't look at anything else. Um, whereas the orange ones, you know, they'll, they'll pick up uh, that something is coming towards them from a long way away. So this is just a way to add variety to your agent. You know, maybe this particular type of agent is very focused, so they're not looking around. But maybe this one has a very wide field of view because they're worried. I mean, these guys kind of look a bit worried <laughs> uh, here. Um, but there's also something like attention span, right? Like when you're walking around, you're looking at things, you don't necessarily see something interesting and then just stare at it until you can't see it anymore, right? There's usually a time that you kind of lose interest in whatever you're looking at. So here's just two sort of extreme examples where on the top, they basically have infinite uh, attention span. And so long as they can see it, they'll look at it. Whereas on the bottom, we gave them a very short attention span. So you'll see as this thing goes by, they look at it, and then they kind of look away, and then they see it again, and they look at it again, and they look away. So you have a, you know, a wide range of possibilities here. But you can see, even in this very simple example, how just adding that, you know, there's no keyframe animation here, adds this, this character to the character, right? They start to feel like they're in the world, basically. So there's also some underlying tech here where basically what we're doing is under the hood, creating an IK uh, solve, usually from like the waist to the top of the bottom of the spine to the top of the head. And then we adjust that depending on your, uh, your input. So in this case, 
There's head weighting and eye weighting, just to give you an example. So on the top, what we've done is we've weighted the movement of the head to basically the highest amount. So what that means is when they see something, they just turn their head towards it, right? And then the eyes obviously naturally follow when they do that. Um, but on the bottom, we've weighted the eyes more, which means that when they see something, their eyes will dart to it, and then their head will slowly turn to match up with the eyes. And that kind of gives you a bit of a more realistic feel. Most people move their eyes first, right? And then their head follows it. And so you have a lot of options there for, again, making things look more believable just by tweaking the weights. And we just did the head and eyes here, but of course it could be the whole spine, whatever you want to include in that IK chain. So all of our examples so far I've had a single look at, but in this example we've just scattered, you see those little sort of spheres there, we've just scattered them on a grid. And the agents will walk around and look at whichever one they see. And based on their attention span, they'll look away and find another target. Or they won't find a target and they'll just look forward. So these lookouts are, are dynamic, right? They're not, it's not a static thing. And on top of that, you can weight them. So you could say, oh, this thing is more interesting than this thing, right? So maybe if, you have, if the agent has a choice, it'll prefer to look at you know, something it's interested in rather than something else. So that just adds more dynamics to this uh, sort of secondary simulation almost. So here's just a view kind of from the top of what's happening. You can see these little green lines which are indicating the focus, where they're looking at any moment. And sometimes they approach one of the dots and they look at it, sometimes they walk past and they switch to another target. Um, but there's more than that. So the look at can also be used as a trigger for behavior. So you can, for instance, like in this example, say, if you see one of these red dots, which might be a little hard to see here on the screen, but start running. You know, it's a very simple trigger and a change in behavior, but you can see the blue agents, when they see these little red dots, and there's kind of one almost in the middle there, they'll suddenly turn uh, red as they start to run, they'll change their animation, they'll change their behavior, and then they'll eventually turn orange and just keep running in that direction. So the look at is not just to tweak the crowd, um, in a sense of looking at things, it's also a way of triggering behavior, which means you can have things like when they see danger, maybe they want to run. If they see, you know, whatever, probably an explosion, let's face it, there's probably an explosion. So they're going to run uh, from the explosion, you know. It's, it's whatever is, is useful at any given time. And when you see it rendered like this, even though these are all like the same blue agent, and really their only behavior is to randomly wander or run, and w or run away, but just by adding that look at, it really gives a lot of life to this scene, right? This is a very simple crowd scene with essentially two states. And yet you occasionally see them kind of nervously look around. You'll see a guy run through the center of frame now in a second with his arms out. So, you know, you get this behavior with just a few things. And you can imagine, you know, if you actually layered on real, um, more realistic behaviors, you would have a much more believable crowd. Um, of course, speaking of that, here's a more believable <laughs> crowd. Um, they're still basically just wandering essentially randomly, the trick here is that they're actually looking at each other. So there are no look at targets in the environment. Instead, we've said, hey, if you see, if you have dark clothing or light clothing and you see somebody wearing the opposite color to you and they're heading toward you, so not if they're walking away, but if they're coming toward you, look at them. So now you get this feeling that the crowd agents are actually interacting with each other in some sort of meaningful way. And as we pull out here, I also just want to mention that, you know, this is not just for close-ups or for um, hero versions of crowd agents, you can apply this to every agent in your scene, right? There's, there's not a huge performance hit in doing this. So you have a lot of benefit. You can add this to every character you want. And a final note I want to make here is that this is part of the crowd solver. It's in, inside of our you know, DOPS, our dynamics context. But there's also a SOP version of this. So the SOP version can't use triggers and things because the simulation is done but you can still modify the agents in SOPs using this look at, which is really nice because it means you can do a generic crowd simulation. Maybe, maybe there's complex behaviors and all that stuff and you don't even want to get into thinking about look ats because it's not relevant to your scene. Bake all that out and then apply the look at to it in basically a real time sort of environment where you can grab things and move them around and see how they interact with it. So much like uh, Rob mentioned us trying to move things into SOPs, this is, this is more. It's like we want to make more of these tools available to you outside of the simulation context because, you know, artists are, are sort of familiar and feel at ease in SOPs. So again, it's a 0.5 release, so a lot of the things are like continuations of things that we started. So here's some more 
um, updates to our muscle simulations. And this is a pretty simple one, but it solves a real problem. And a lot of these problems we've now learned from, from our users, right? That's one of the, the benefits of putting a tool out there is people tell you what they think of it. <laughs> and so you can start you know, making adjustments based on that. And a really common problem with any sort of character simulation, whether it's muscles or cloth, is bulky sort of characters like this, they put their arms down by their side and there's no room for anything in there to live, right? Cloth will get trapped in there, tissue will get trapped in there. And so what these things basically are, these things that don't really affect the simulation in terms, of the, in terms of the velocity and so on, but they will act as a collider. And so when the character puts its arms down, these sort of rigid plates that we're talking about there, these rigid spacers, basically just ensure that there will be a gap in that area for your simulation down the road. We're also starting to play around with these ideas of retargeting muscle and tissue onto different characters. So in this case, you know, we have the, the bruiser on the left who was fully rigged with the intent of using it on that character. And then on the right, we have this totally different character, totally different size and shape, um, still you know, essentially the same anatomy. And we want to retarget all the muscles and bones onto that character so that we can just start running sims there. So you know, do a setup once and propagate it to all of your other characters. Um, and this is basically using our, uh, our, our retargeting tools for, for skin, topo transfer. And the basic workflow here is to set up landmarks, just as you would expect between your mesh for, in this case, the bruiser, and your mesh for the um, uh, sort of troll character. And then do the topo transfer, so you have the same mesh now transferred to the troll. And then we can use our new point-to-form node, which has a lot of new options to make point-to-forming better, to essentially use that skin to deform everything inside of it. So it basically drags along the bones, the muscles, the tissue, all the stuff that you would need um, for the next step of your simulation. So this is a really nice workflow that almost, it's not really even a new tool per se, it's really just like a discovery you know, that we made as we were producing new tools saying like, hey, you know, you can actually get pretty far just with the tools that exist. And now that, of course, has inspired us for the future to think about, well, can we, can we make this more robust? Can we make this into a more sort of solid um, example? But you can see you can get pretty far just as it is. <clears throat> Another tool we're sort of playing around with, I don't know if people remember the original muscle release, but there was this thing called uh, Franken muscles. And <laughs> Franken muscles were basically, oops, sorry about that, let me just go back. There we go. Um, Franken muscles were basically the idea that you could sculpt a bunch of muscles and then combine them into a single muscle. And the reason you might want to do that is a lot of times, like things like your deltoids, you know, there's, there's actually multiple muscles in there but most of the time they kind of work at the same time. They usually don't do too much that's that different. But in this case, you can combine them, but still have them trigger as if they were separate, still have them flex and move as if they were separate, but they're technically one mesh. And that buys you a couple of things. One, um, there's less collisions, right? You've, you've basically created a solid thing that will collide with other muscles, but internally there's no real collisions there. It's, it's a solid unit. Um, you're also gaining some performance and usually memory as well because, again, you're not dealing with all the complexity. So this just gives you an option. Not everybody's going to need this, but if you have a, a character and you don't need, you know, full hero fidelity muscles on this character, you just need a feeling of muscles under the skin, this can get you a long way there uh, at a faster rate. Um, so again, really, you know, it's a, it's a 0.5 release. We're moving towards those workflows. So. Uh, the capybara here is fully uh, rigged up. It's got muscles. Um, and, you know, this was really a test case to say, like, okay, let's see how our, let's see how our tools have evolved, you know? And so the whole setup basically from being handed the, the rig and the muscles to full simulation was about three hours. So that means a person can, you know, take something and get a result pretty quickly. Um, and that does include the tissue, by the way. So here we have uh, our capybara. He's, uh, he's 
he's a little shy, but um, he's, this is with sort of a tissue solve that's pretty, you know, pretty tight. So there's a little jiggle in some places, but this is really more about getting the feeling of muscles moving under the skin than it is really about you know, having a bouncy, jiggly character or something like that. But you can still see a little bit. And the nice thing is collisions and so on. It gives a feeling of like, the tissue really being there. And then here's an example of the, the, the same animation just applied with a much sort of looser tissue setup. And now suddenly you've got this you know, <laughs> sort of over-exaggerated probably simulation, but you see all this life that suddenly shows up. The cheeks are bouncing, the belly, the way the arms interact with the shoulders and uh, the sort of meat around the neck. And just to compare the two. So both very valid tissue simulations, but really comes down to uh, you know, which one you need at any given time. Because sometimes it actually is useful, especially like a more muscular character, to have the type of sim on the left. And then maybe you know, your grizzly bears, your loose-skinned animals, your creatures like that will have something like on the right. Um, so here now with the fur, using our new grooming tools, um, really, again, an extension of the tools we had before applied to the tight uh, tissue simulation. And one thing I want to point out here is this is rendered with XPU. And when you're working with fur, um, it's difficult to evaluate it looking at OpenGL or anything like that. You can get pretty good results, but it'll never be the same as all the sort of advantages you'll get from doing a full render. So for look dev of furred characters, XPU is, is, is amazing. This is 50 seconds per frame, you know, noise free, motion blur um, fur. Um, but if you're doing look dev and you just, I want to check the lighting, I want to verify this fur looks correct, it's, it's seconds to render it. It's, it's really is a game changer for look dev of furry creatures with XPU because it happens almost instantaneous. And so now we have our, our, our jiggly uh, capybara. Um, you see, you, here you really get a sense of the stuff under the skin moving around on top, you know, the fur on top of that. I do want to point out that there's no secondary simming happening here, by the way. There, there's no vellum sim or anything like that. This is just the muscle sim with the fur um, applied. But even here, it kind of has the feel that it is simulated, even though it isn't. So you can imagine you could get an, even an extra stage of belie believability by adding that fur sim on top. So as we said, you know, we're constantly just improving these tools bit by bit. You know, we've tried to improve the performance. We've tried to improve uh, the mirroring. We're making these, these changes so that you can work on a groom um, closer to the final groom, you know, getting as close to that final result as you can while still working at the guides and working at nice interactive speeds. Um, and here's the result of that, again, rendered in XPU. So, it sort of raises a bit of a question, though, right? So we've got this, this character, and it's, you know, it's so complex. I forget. I think there's 4 million curves. There's, there's a lot of hairs on one of these things. <laughs> They're very hairy things. Um, so, so we've done that. And then you know, maybe we want to add like a, a little bit of a sim or something to it. So here's just an example of just adding a, you know, just a little bit of wind um, to the fur. And the question becomes, well, well how do I actually render this, right? Like, how do I get this high-res fur into Karma? And up until now, the answer was generate 5 million curves <laughs> and then store them on disk and read it back in and, and you know, you've got your fur, which is not a great answer <laughs> um, because that's a lot of potential data, especially if you've had lots of these characters. So, some of you may know that Mantra actually had something called a fur procedural. And what that basically was is that you could take this hair generation network, and when you went to render it, it generated the curves at render time. So it was never stored to disk. It just handed the render the curves and said, here's your high resolution fur. And it's a really, really useful tool because it saves tons of data, saves caching things out. The problem is it only worked with Mantra. So as soon as you were trying to render with a third party uh, renderer or something, you know, you were out of luck. You were back to baking everything out. So in 19.5, we've introduced this something called husk procedurals. Husk being the thing that generates renders through Hydra to USD and so on. And what a husk procedural allows you to do is exactly what I just said. You have a network, a fur network. At render time, it generates the fur and it hands it off to the renderer. The wonderful thing is that if you're a Karma, if you're a, sorry, a Hydra render delegate, you can now consume these procedurals. So here you see Karma XPU, CPU, Arnold, and RenderMan all generating this hair at render time. Right? 
guides. So they're taking the guides, they're generating this here at render time to get this result. So again, saving you tons of data, tons of caching out. And um, we don't have an example here, but there's actually two modes. So you can take a full high res simulation that you, or sorry, uh, groom that you've produced anywhere. Maybe it's Houdini, maybe it's somewhere else and then just deform it at render time. So maybe you do want to generate all those curves, but you only want to do it once. <laughs> you don't want to do it on every frame. So you can actually use the, the new fur and hair procedural to deform the hair. And technically speaking, the technology that allows this um, is much more generic in th than that. So in the future, what you're going to start to see is almost generic geometry processing happening at render time through this husk procedural with networks that you build. So not like this, our hair procedural is essentially a fixed sort of pipeline. But down the road, you'll be able to build your own sort of network of nodes and have those generate things at render time, which is very exciting. Obviously, fur is an easy example, but you can imagine just about anything that you would like to build at render time um, that maybe you don't need to see all the time as a really, really useful feature. OK, so we're going to move on to modeling and side effects labs. And once again, I'm going to bring up Rob to introduce. Thanks. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, let's talk about muscles first. I think uh, we're getting some really nice results from uh, what we saw today. Um, we're getting closer. We feel really good about it. There's a couple of things left that we feel like we want to make sure that we get in there because we want to ensure that we're delivering reliable, realistic results um, to you and, and, and to your clients. Um, grooming, we're working on an all new feathering system going forward, including art, di art directed feathers. Uh, with crowds, we have things like artistic controlled motion paths. Um, and of course, we're working on, with Kinefex, we're moving towards an all new animation and rigging system for Houdini 20, including dynamic rigging and adding physics to your animations within the viewport. So, very exciting stuff going forward. Um, modeling, so we've talked a lot tonight about quality of life. We want to continue to up that quality of life for you, provide amazing tools, make life easier for you, give you more interaction in the viewport. So we continue to strive to improve that as much as we can. Um, with the amazing Side Effects Labs team, they continue to create great tools like the Polywire UV tool and the uh, new ambient occlusion tool to help, again, with that quality of life. So, Again, back to Scott to go through some of those tools. <laughs> All right, thanks, Rob. All right, so let's start off with the Curve tool. We introduced the new Curve tool in Houdini 19. It has a ton of features in it, but we weren't quite done. We want to add it some more. So one of the things we're going to show you is this automatic um, control point. So when you switch things to automatic, instead of controlling the handles, it basically attempts to smoothly interpolate through the control points. Um, what that means is, you know, obviously you get these rounded corners, but also you can sort of move things around in a much easier way. But if you want to go back to Bezier handles, you absolutely can. So this is a per point control. And speaking of that, there's now orientation is handled on the curve stop. So if you look, you can see the little spine sort of rotating around. And this is really critical for some types of tools, right, where you want to be able to have things spiral or move around a curve. So the combination of those things allow you to then take that curve tool, embed it in an HDA. Here's sort of a classic racetrack uh, HDA, probably one of the first HDAs you, you ever built if you've used Houdini. Uh, and you can see how having access to all those tools almost just lets you sculpt this asset. You're just grabbing it and moving it. It feels very natural in the viewport. If you want to bank that curve, you know, you, you turn on your orientation handles and you just go ahead and bank those curves. So not only does the curve stop give you these tools, but then the curve sock can be embedded inside of other tools, giving you a lot more control. Of course, you can drive all this stuff procedurally as well with orientation along curves, other nodes like that. But this is a really nice interactive version of it. And on top of that, we're, every release, we're sort of moving towards making the curve sop itself fully procedural so that you can drive it via attributes. You can ingest curves and say, these points are auto curves. The orientation on these curves are this or that. So you'll eventually be able to drive all of this that way. But for now, it's really the focus is the interaction um, with the curve and other HDAs. Um, since we're talking about these tools and sort of the UX and UI around them, we've also added some preferences for the HUD. So the HUD gives you lots of information about your, your tool, and we've added some convenience options like 
you know, simple stuff like a drop shadow, for instance, um, for when the background is bright. Or maybe you actually want to add a background um, so that you can really see the HUD information without being cluttered by other things. Um, we've also added controls for the size of it. So, that, you know, if you want it very small just up in the corner, you can go ahead and make it very small and it'll hide away up there. Of course, you can hide the whole tool itself as well with Shift F1. But this is just another way. We're just trying to get you to work, you know, in the viewport, use the HUD, and then, of course, give those tools to you to build your own HUDs, right? So now your HUDs can take advantage of this. So when you build a tool, you can use the same tools we use, right? So the tools then kind of become cohesive even if you have custom tools um, within them. So here's a really interesting note, and this is a very low level node. We've kind of gone from extremely high level to very low level. So this is something called uh, tangent field sum. And just sort of a brief explanation of a tangent field. I mean, it kind of is like what it sounds like. You get tangents on the geometry, it's usually flowing along the surface. And the goal of this node is to make those as smooth as possible. Right? So they follow the geometry in logical ways. You can see the ones you know, on the hard edges following those hard edges. You can see the ones on the surface following those surface. Um, it can also be calculated on the primitives themselves, so you have a lot of options. And if you look at these little red dots, it might be a little hard to see on the screen here, but there's these little red dots called singularities. And that's places where you have to internally split the mesh apart so that you can calculate these. It's almost like a... a uh, a parametric set of UVs that we create for this node so we can generate the tangents. But you can imagine with some control, you know, some interesting effects you can get. So here's just an example where, you know, the long sort of yellow vectors that you see are just an attribute on those points that point in some random direction. They're just rotating around. But you'll see all the other tangent vectors smoothly interpolating, trying to account for the directions that you've set on those attributes. And again, this is just an example just kind of drive home the idea of smoothly transitioning between these tangents and interpolating over the whole surface. You know, it's not local, it's the entire surface. And where you can go, I mean, this already kind of looks like, you know, a starting groom setup or something, right? But you can imagine driving particles from this or using this to generate geometry where maybe these kinds of patches and directions um, are important. So here's a suite of tools, really, from Side Effects Labs dealing with uh, cleaning up scan data. In this case, some photogrammetry of that sort of castle that you see in the lower left there. And here's a, a great example of how like a suite of tools doesn't necessarily have to be directly related to the task, right? So here we've got this physical ambient occlusion, which is uh, basically trying to get the ambient occlusion support that we have closer to something that you might get from a ray tracer rather than the kind of rough approximation that we've, we have already. And you can see some really, really nice results here um, on Crag. And there's, you know, more options for, like, peaks and valleys or generating kind of dirt masks and things like that. But at its heart, it's just various types of ambient occlusion. So, you know, what does that have to do with mesh cleanup? <laughs> you know, why do we care about finding the peaks and valleys or, or so on? Um, well, I mean, the, the answer is that, you know, these meshes are complicated. You want to reduce the data. You want to remove, reduce things in areas where you can't see them, for instance. That's a very useful thing. So occlusion can be used to say, like, hey, you know what? We can really smooth this part of the model a lot because you can't see it, basically. You know, or it's like, oh, these are the edges, and people are going to spot that silhouette, so we don't want to smooth there, you know? So you can generate masks with the ambient occlusion, just as an example. Now, this is a really interesting part of this tool set, spectral feature transfer. So imagine you've done a scan, and a very typical problem is that you've got grass or bushes or small objects in your scan, and they rarely scan well, because it's really hard to get around, you know, <laughs> every flower in your scene, you're not going to walk 360 around and take pictures, right? So there's always missing data. It's noisy. You want to clean that up. And so what the feature transfer allows you to do is kind of essentially a smoothing operation to begin with, where we smooth out those details, try and remove it, you know, in various ways. Uh, it kind of gives you a mesh that's, you know, it's okay, but it doesn't really look like what it should. It doesn't look like what it's supposed to be. And then this last stage, which is kind of really the feature transfer part, is kind of think of it like a clone brush <laughs> in uh, Photoshop or something. It's finding the good areas and then transferring that detail to the bad areas, basically. So it tries to fill them in uh, with data that makes sense, even though it's not technically part of the scan. 
And of course, the idea then is that you, you go back with your plant assets or any of your cleaned up assets and you scatter them back and you fill out the environment like this. And just as an aside, this is uh, Unreal Engine 5 using Nanite. So you see this super high detail mesh and it looks, it looks great. So this is, again, a suite of tools that technically aren't related, but all together allow you to get to this kind of result. And continuing on with this sort of suite of tools example here, here's this really cool poly scalpel tool. And um, you know, we're using the exploded view here just to show where things are breaking apart, but basically cutting geometry with other pieces of geometry, you know, at its heart, that's what's happening here. Sort of like a, sort of like a Boolean. Where it gets really interesting is as soon as you start thinking about curves, right? Where you want intersecting curves to find those intersections. You want to cut those curves. Any curve network can benefit from a tool like this. Essentially a way of almost finding intersections and then adjusting the geometry based on where those intersections are occurring. And you can see it's, it's nice and accurate. You get very accurate um, results with these overlapping curves, which is actually pretty difficult to, to calculate. Um, but it's not just, you know, generic curves. It's also things like this. You know, think of this basically as some kind of room builder where you're drawing a footprint using curves and then you want the, those footprints to cut up the geometry in useful ways. You know, cut up the hallways between rooms, cut up the rooms, uh, maybe add geometry to cut doorways and things. Um, but again, basically you're just using geometry to cut other geometry in a convenient way. A nice option here is this snapping option that was added where basically, you know, if you're cutting lots of geometry with other pieces of geometry, there's, there's a pretty good chance you're going to think you snapped something to something and then there's going to be a small sliver of geometry there. So this really just helps you with that. It helps snap geometry to other pieces of geometry without doing too much distortion, you know, based on the geometry that's around it. And now here, again, a bunch of these tools sort of working together, but you know, one of the most common problems, um, certainly in games, but absolutely in film and visual effects as well, is, you know, cities, roads. Uh, anywhere where you've got a whole bunch of geometry that intersects and you need to procedurally generate roadways between them. Uh, but not just that, you need, you know, UVs on that geometry. You know, it can't intersect with each other. Um, you want to be able to, you know, cut the geometries in ways that make sense. And this whole suite of tools kind of builds that for you. Also includes things like um, um, adding geometry patches, which we'll see here just in a second, which means that you can, um, you know, add pieces of geometry to cover up intersections. You know, maybe you've got um, specific geometry with specific UVs that need to go over those patches. Or in this case, maybe you need to, you know, round the corners of those intersections in order to add, I don't know, a sidewalk in a sort of medieval kind of setting or something like that. Um, but either way, again, a whole suite of tools dedicated to a task, but each of them with their own individual uses, right? Yes, they're, they're targeted towards this large use case, but each one of them sort of individually useful in their own way. And speaking of individually useful, this is a great tool um, for, again, kind of dealing with these uh, wire networks. You know, tree is a good example, where you may have specific needs for how the UVs need to be laid out, right? Different uses have different ideas. You know, if this is something somebody's going to sculpt on and it's going to be a unique tree, maybe you want to pack everything into one UV square. If you're doing tiling textures, maybe you want them to go outside, you know, zero to one in UV space, but just not overlap each other. Um, or maybe you do. So this tool provides a lot of options for that. And then what's really cool is to see it interact here with our uh, KinFX tools. This is using rig pose to basically pose this tree. And this is kind of the point we've been sort of iterating on over, over the release here is to say, you know, tools don't necessarily have to have a specific function. Like what if they just all kind of work together? Why can't you just rig a tree just to pose it, right? Why can't you use these tools to create animation that's not really traditional animation in the way you might imagine. It's just taking advantage of the tool set that we provide and combining them in ways that are kind of unexpected. Like this is a, a beautiful result by just basically unfolding this KinFX rig um, as the tree grows and expands. Of course, just a nice sort of beauty shot of some of the trees that this tool is able to generate. It's really nice. Okay, so visual effects. Once again, invite Rob back up. Thanks. <clears throat> there we go. Can we hear me now? Nope. Okay. So, um, there we go. Now <laughs> I can hear it. Okay. 
Uh, great stuff in there. You know, it's lots of quality of life, lots of utility tools in there that we will continue to work on, and the labs team will grow as well, adding more tools as fast as they can, right? Um, but it's not just that stuff, it's we're working on improving all of our meshing tools. Um, we're even working on a specialized mesh tool to go along with our new LiDAR node that uh, is in 19 to take advantage of a lot of that specific metadata that's attached to LiDAR. So uh, yeah, again, a lot of quality of life tools to make the experience as pleasant as possible. Uh, so effects, was anybody worried we weren't gonna talk about effects tonight? <laughs> no, okay. Um, so I'm happy to say that, of course, no Houdini release would be complete without talking about effects. And uh, as Kristen mentioned at the very beginning, I'm happy to say that now we've completed the family of Dynamics and SOPs by adding uh, flip fluids to join the rest of the family, vellum, rigid bodies, and pyro at SOP level. Um, and so that's exciting, and I know everybody's happy about that. Everybody prefers working in SOPs most of the time. Um, in, addi in addition to that, we've added things like custom uh, flip boundaries. We've improved GPU acceleration for pyro with things like turbulence. And again, a lot of other you know, quality of life enhancements to the FX tools. So back to you. All right. Thanks, Rob. Uh, all right. Pyro and fluids. Uh, we're going to start out with pyro, um, fire and smoke. And so pyro source instancing. So in our last release, we had something like this, and it was designed for the minimal solver, our sort of GPU-based uh, pyro solver. And the idea there was that, you know, if you wanted to move a source around on the GPU, it's sort of inefficient to, to load that all up, all that animation up onto the GPU. Instead, you want to load up the source and then basically on the GPU just transform it to different places. So we had this idea of, hey, why don't we instance the sources onto the GPU? which is really nice. But as soon as we did that and we started thinking about it, I was like, well, wait a minute. Why, why can't we do this with more elaborate sources? And why is it only on the GPU? That's actually a concept that's actually very useful in general. So here what you're seeing is that each of these different effects are a different pyro instance source, right? So these little sort of ignitions, that sort of burst of smoke, the smoke at the top. And basically what you're doing is creating kind of a library of effects that you can apply to your simulation. So here's a bunch of sort of almost random effects being instanced into this simulation and giving you these unique sort of results. Now this is kind of a, you know, just a, a grab bag of different types of pyro simulations all working together. Um, of course, it does continue to work on the minimal solver on the GPU. So in this case, we have that sort of uh, arcing source um, being moved around there in, in real time. Of course, there's no real good reason to just drag this around like that. Um, but if you are placing your instances in your scene and you want to get that feedback, it is actually useful to see how they will interact, you know, if, if this instance was here versus there and so on. But at the core of this, if you look at these sort of columns of nodes, each one of those is a different type of explosion or a source. Um, so you can have like small explosions, big explosions, ground explosions, air explosions, uh, secondary explosions, you know, that happen inside of an explosion that already exists. And then you take those instances and you apply them to your sim. So you can set when they should go off, what their orientation is, how big they are, how much they contribute to the overall sim. So now, instead of just trying to build this monolithic source that has to do everything that the sim needs to do, you can actually just say, like, oh, I want a little dust hit here. I want a little extra explosion here at the top of my, you know, huge plume. Um, and then you just assemble those. And when you assemble them, again, throughout time, anywhere in space, and <laughs> time and space, um, <laughs> but also, uh, you know, their scale and so on. So really, this means you can build a library, right? So now effects artists can actually just be building almost generic versions of effects and then compositing them all together to create larger, bigger effects, which is something people already kind of do, but this instancing sort of formalizes it and makes it more efficient because you're just instancing these things um, into the sim, especially um, on the, the minimal solver. So a really huge workflow um, improvement moving you towards this almost sculpting approach to uh, sourcing. 
Um, of course, if you're going to be working quickly and you have these awesome new tools, you're also going to want it to look nice if you can in the viewport. Um, you know, especially if your your simulations need to be sent, you know, to a render farm or uh, you know across a network somewhere to be to be rendered. Having you know nice viewport um, representations of your shaders is really helpful just to to help you iterate. So we're improving the environment lighting in the viewport here now. So again, this is all uh, you know in the OpenGL viewport, just using an environment light. Here's just a quick example of enabling the the, the environment light. Sorry, so you can see the effect, and it gives you know. It makes it very volumetric and interesting looking. This is all lit by an environment light. So again, just trying to improve you know, the look of things so that you don't always have to turn to the render, especially on these sims that maybe will take a while to render. Speaking of taking a while to render, here is a uh, fluid sim. It's you know, pretty high res. Um, the interesting thing here is this velocity voxel scaling. So this is a technique people have been using for a long time. And again, we wanted to formalize it inside the solver. So the idea here is that you have a high resolution simulation. Your density, your temperature, all those things are high resolution. But your velocity is a different resolution. Because oftentimes, you don't even see those sort of micro velocities that you're actually generating in those fields. So on the left is you know, the un unaltered simulation. And all the way on the right um, is a simulation that is eight and a half times faster <laughs> um, just by reducing the resolution of the velocity grid. Now, you can tell, right? You can tell that there's a difference to that one all the way on the right. It's definitely lost a little bit of detail. But motion detail, and that's a key point. It's not detail of the smoke. It's not detail of what you're going to render. It's the movement that's lost detail. But in the middle, even though it's you know 2.25 times faster than the original, it's almost identical. Can you no spot differences? Absolutely, you can. But there's a huge benefit to both memory and performance when you do this, right? So now it's sort of an option for you to use. You know, is this a hero shot where I'm going to be right up in that smoke and I need those micro velocities, those little curls, um, or is it you know a background element and it's not worth paying the cost? I still want the detail in the smoke. You know, I don't want a low res simulation. I just am not as concerned about the tiny, tiny details, again, of the motion itself. So this is a really useful tool now. You can kind of scale up and down your simulation um, and get these, these results without paying a huge cost. Um, we're also you know, continuing to work on our exports of these things. So you can generate all this stuff, but what if you work in a real-time scenario you know, and you can't deal with these massive simulations? So we're just side effects labs, again, coming in, improving the tools. We already made a huge improvement in 19. Now more improvements in 19.5. Here's just an example in Unreal and Unity, kind of using a, a sprite sheet kind of workflow. And more than that, it's not just about you know, making the tools a little easier to use, which definitely is important. But it's also about providing you know, the community with information about, well, why do you want to do this? How do I do this? Uh, maybe, I'll, maybe you want to build your own tools, and this, these learning materials will help you get up there. So we're kind of talking about production tested, things that people have really used. We're getting that feedback, that information, then we're putting it out as learning material to help people get over that hump and really start taking advantage of the tools that we offer. You know, and there's, there's more than just your standard sort of pyro. There are these, you know, very effectsy, games effectsy sort of uh, setups, and you want to know how to do it. You know, how do you get this into a game engine in a reasonable way? Um, so again, taking feedback, putting it out there as learning material, hopefully getting people up to speed on these tools as quickly as possible. Okay, so fluids. Um, Let's talk about a couple of things before we get to the, the SOP level flip solver. And we're going to start out with the ocean spectra. So you saw this render um, earlier in the presentation you know, using the ocean LOP. But underlying it is uh, a new uh, Encino Waves support. So Encino Waves are kind of just a, basically a new library of waves. Um, and the controls to get at those waves are much simpler than the standard sort of uh, setup we had in the past. So if you look at this, you know, they all look like waves, which is obviously the goal. Um, but under the hood, it's a little easier to use. It's easier to get to an ocean that looks believable, and the controls are much simpler. Which again, you know, Rob has mentioned it a couple of times, quality of life and workflow. Um, so this really gets you to where you need to go faster with oceans. 
Here's a really interesting tool from Side Effects Lab. So um, if you look close, you'll see this sort of wake traveling through the water there. And that's something called a Kelvin wake. So this is a type of essentially deformer, really. It's not even really a simulation. It's something that generates these wakes. Um, and then you can add them to your ocean. So it's a really nice, convenient option if you, know, you don't want to run a full simulation on this stuff. You just need something that indicates a wake behind it really quickly. And this essentially works in real time, because like I said, it's not really a simulation um, at all. But still, a really nice, useful effect. And here is the shallow water solver. This is a brand new fluid solver inside of Houdini. This works on height fields. So it's a 2D fluid simulation. So looking at this, you might think, like, oh, well, you know, don't we have the ripple solver? Isn't that a thing that I can use? You know? And that wasn't 2D, that's 3D. Like, why do I need this thing versus the ripple solver? Um, and there's some really good reasons. One, the ripple solver is not really fluid dynamics, really. It's basically a bunch of springs <laughs> next to each other. Um, but on top of that, it doesn't really have any fluid dynamics at all. So in this case, you know, the water lands on the rocks, and then it runs down the rocks, and it eventually fills up um, this sort of area. And you see the drops that are hitting the water are creating ripples and so on. So it is a 2D solve, so you don't get splashes. You don't get things like that. But if you imagine trying to run a flip simulation to give you this result, you absolutely could do it, but there would be a very high cost of doing it. It would have to be very high resolution to capture these kinds of details. Um, so you'd be paying an enormous cost for not really that much value, whereas this runs very quickly. You're basically operating on a, a more or less a texture map, really. And so you can get this sim out you know, a second a frame, less, depending on the resolution. So you can get a really high quality result um, without having to go to a full, full-on flip simulation. And the nice thing is, because it is in our height field workflow, you can do things like, hey, I want to bake that out as a texture map sequence, or I want to bake that out uh, and then start doing things like smoothing areas that I don't like, or maybe I want to add some noise, and you just use the height field tools to do it. So keeping it in that format suddenly opens up a ton of possibilities of how you can edit this. You know, I think there would be a lot of possibilities there if you wanted to do kind of a non-photoreal fluid simulation, you know, and add interesting detail um, on top of this. Now, we do also export velocity, acceleration, and curvature from this tool as well. So you have a lot of opportunities to manipulate the data after the simulation if you want to have particles floating on the surface and things like that. So again, don't think of the 2D as necessarily a limitation. It just has a specific purpose. Right? Of course, in the future, we want to revisit things like the, the ripple solver for fully three-dimensional objects. Um, but for the moment, this is kind of a first step, uh, you know, a bit of a, a niche solution to a problem, but also a really, really handy one for some situations. OK, so the flip, SOP level fluids. Um, so this little sort of background that you've seen a couple of times was done using our SOP solver. Um, and the SOP solver, you know, is, it's a SOP level tool. We've tried to make it mimic as much as possible the other SOP level simulation tools. Um, again, putting artists in the context that they're most familiar with, because many times you don't actually really need to go into um, the, dy the dynamics network. What you're more interested in is like the forces and so on, right? And so those can be set up um, in SOPs. And of course, we have a whole suite of tools to support that. These are all new SOPs to help you uh, get up to speed with this new workflow. Because it is a little different. It's more volumetric based than it is particle based, even though the sim itself obviously has a particle element to it. So we're you know, providing a lot of help to get you up to speed. For instance, we've taken all of our old shelf tools and we've converted them over to uh, the new SOP workflow. So again, you can say like, well, how do I, I don't understand. How do I set up a beach in this scenario? You know, um, what about just like a generic ocean? Um, nothing really new here. It's just, again, a, a way of helping you learn how to interact with this new tool and what the idiosyncrasies of it might be. Here's a little preview of Configure Lava, which is not playing for some reason. Well, it's, it's viscosity. Let's, let's move on. Here's some more viscosity. It's not lava. Maybe it's very brown lava. I don't know. But it's, he's moving through some sort of very viscous fluid here. Um, and this is something you've seen you know, probably dozens and dozens of times in Houdini, a character moving through a viscous fluid. You know, it's all at the SOP level, which is nice. But the real benefit is that this new SOP solver 
is not just taking flip fluids and putting it in stops. There's a whole suite of tools that make this much more than that. So here's a camera frustrum domain where we're calling out the particles as we move. And this is enabled basically because now we have um, really excellent control of what, you know, boundary conditions on a fluid simulation. So we've had some of that in the past, but we've taken it even further. Sort of inspired by FAB, and if you know FAB flux animated boundaries, um, but basically taking the velocity, you know, that theoretically exists outside of the domain and making sure it affects what's inside, right? So if you're pretending there's an ocean out there, it sort of acts as if those velocities exist. Um, but we're kind of going further than that. You know, it's not just the velocity boundaries. We have hydrostatic boundaries and pressure-based boundaries. And that gives you much better interactions with the edges, less things like reflections from the edges where, you know, velocities get a bit confused. And it also means that because this is all now volume-based, you can have these custom boundaries. You can see this crazy boundary, not only uh, changing, uh, not only sort of spiky and oddly shaped, but changing shape over time, right? And you might look at this and think like, well, <laughs> I mean, that's neat, but why would I ever want to do that? You know, why would I want that in my simulation? Um, and maybe this does, example doesn't prove it to you, but it, start thinking about how you can optimize your simulation to get exactly the data um, that you want. I'm just trying to get that slide to start playing, sorry. There we go. Um, so in this case, you know, we have this animation path. And, you know, maybe you only want to sim right around the character, right? But you still want it to move dynamically through the environment. Um, or maybe you do want a full path. Or maybe you want to do a low-res full path and a high-res close-up and then merge them together. Maybe you want to have two completely separate sims that eventually interact with each other just briefly as they cross over each other, right? So it's really a way of just letting you have full control over what is being simulated where with, you know, these boundary conditions that I'm talking about to make sure that these things will eventually kind of mesh together in a reasonable way. It's not seamless, you know, the, a high-res fluid sim is never going to match a low-res fluid sim exactly, but it'll get you a long way there. And here's almost the sort of textbook example of where this would be useful, right? You've simulated maybe a very large-scale river, and it may even be a very high-resolution version of that river. But if you put the camera on, you know, one section, you know, now that resolution isn't quite so high anymore, right? Because you're, you've zoomed in on it. So you can use the, the fluid uprising tools to say, you know, okay, feed me the low resolution boundary conditions and then I'll run a high resolution part just in the middle and then I'll combine those together so the things next to the camera are very high resolution and things further away remain high resolution because they're, you know, smaller in the background. And you can take this even further and say, okay, now let's add an element that only simulates around that element. So when I move my camera in, I'm getting, you know, super high resolution right next to um, our collision object. In this case, sort of this truck driving through a river, right? And you can see how the simulations all come together now at the end. And suddenly this opens up, I think, a whole new way of thinking about working with fluids like this, where you're not confined to like, well, if I want high res, I've got to do this giant simulation. It's like, no, I've got, you know, maybe just splashes from a character walking through a river. Let's simulate that. Oh, I've got a, a river, we'll do a low res and a high res pass, and so on. And it means that you can work on things almost in isolation to a certain degree because you know that the animation is going to flow through those boundaries, those new boundary conditions to give you new results. So here <laughs> you've got this enormous shark coming up out of the water behind this boat, for instance, but simmed completely separately, right? But able to ingest one sim and add that into its own sim to give you this sort of more seamless result. And on and on it goes, multiple boats uh, on multiple paths, for instance. Um, suddenly, you know, you can spread your simulations across your render firm uh, to some degree. Of course, you're going to need some sort of information to pass between them. So it's not like you can just isolate them entirely. There needs to be something, you know, sending one piece of data to the next. But nevertheless, um, it gives you a lot, a lot of options. Um, and then finally, just a nice uh, render here with Whitewater. Now, I do want to point out, you know, it is, it is a 0.5 release. The Whitewater solver, unfortunately, remains a DOPS-only tool for 19.5, which means you will need to do that as a secondary pass um, in this sort of traditional way. But obviously, looking forward to Houdini 20, basically, as much as we can possibly get into SOPS will be in SOPS. Um, but luckily, the data still works. So even though the SOP level tool exists, it still works perfectly with the original Whitewater solver. 
And then finally, we've got this really nice little animation here uh, using those SOP tools. You've probably seen this uh, a few times, but the results are really great, all rendered with XPU, kind of bringing everything that we just talked about together into this one simulation. So I'm going to take the opportunity now to welcome Kristen back up to the stage to uh, help wrap up our presentation. All right, thank you. <laughs> this guy, this guy, and that guy. <laughs> thank you so much, Scott and Rob, for tonight's presentation. Amazing tour de force, as always, <laughs> honestly. Uh, we, ho we hope we've been able to impart some of our excitement for Houdini 19.5. And um, you take it, and you play with it, and you tell us what you think. Uh, Houdini launches in just a couple of days. There you go, July 20th. So not long to wait before it, it comes into, uh, into your hands. Um, of course, uh, the night is always too short to show you everything that we'd <laughs> love to show you about the release. Um, but this list uh, hopefully gives you a better idea of everything or most of the things that are making into Houdini 19.5. There's lots of nuggets there that hopefully will, um, you'll find interesting. Um, some of them I'll mention. Uh, how about support for Python 3.9? And no support anymore for Python 2.0 or 2.7, I should say. <laughs> I hear some applause, <laughs> no booing. Um, so there's that, um, um, there's th and there's a lot more. There's a lot more to that. So lighting overrides, for example, in Solaris, that's something that is very, very important to have. And a ton of enhancements to PDG slash TOPS, also known as task management. Um, that's now a very mature part of Houdini. It's uh, enjoying broad uh, attention and broad adoption. Uh, and would you believe it that we launched it on this very stage, if you remember, Scott, exactly three years ago. So time really flies. All right, and that's just the stuff that went into Houdini 19.5, but a good chunk of effort, a good part of our team actually tunneled through, tunneled under 19.5. Um, the idea being that they're working on features and, and frameworks, architectures that will see the light of day in Houdini 20 and after that. And a, a lot of those are inspired um, or, or are exact, you know, implementations of, of many of your wishes, some of them your gripes as well. Um, we don't always uh, respond to the forums, but do know, please, that we watch and we listen. So we, we're planning um, in all the work that we do um, before and in the future, we plan for you know, implementing those wishes, but uh, we have to do that in a kind of steady fashion and also in a way that's sustainable for us as a team. So please bear with us as we get through each and every wish you have. Eventually, we'll get there. Uh, we also have uh, a long-term vision for the CG pipeline, especially now in this age of uh, super high-performance uh, machines and extreme demand for a large-scale procedural computation. And we're talking to studios to make sure we get it right. It's, it's really a paradigm shift, shift that we have in mind. But that's all over the horizon for more of the near to midterm. Uh, you heard some hints from Maybe one or two from Scott. You heard a bunch from Rob. Uh, really, the big one is skin effects, like full-on rigging and animation with embedded physics in into kin effects. That's the big one coming. That's the big train coming to the station. Uh, feathering was mentioned as well. And let me tell you, it's looking awesome already. I'm very excited, personally. Can't wait for you to see it. Um, and, and more and more. Um, how about multi-shot multi -shot management? And you need that as a lighter, you need that for that part of the pipeline, but that could be a lot more than that. That could give you an editorial view into your whole work, right? Into your full session, multi-Houdini sessions in one. So these are the kinds of things that are percolating and, and eventually we'll get to them and, and uh, some of the work has started. Uh, and maybe I'll mention one more. Uh, Vulcan. So uh, we've started uh, a complete redesign, rewrite of the viewport, 
Uh, it has Vulcan at its foundation, so all the goodness that comes with that uh, will come to you. And that will make it not only a modern you know, utility, 3D utility, but the plan is to make it uh, you know, a real-time cinematic render, a complement to the two offline renders, Karma CPU and Karma XPU. So I don't know, can we call that Karma RT? I'm not sure, but that's also in the works, so we're excited about that as well. Now, it's easy for me to talk about all these things that are coming, but truly, uh, the day, the night, belongs to Houdini, 19.5, so I want to end this presentation by thanking everyone who's contributed to it. I'll start with R&D, of course, uh, developers, TDs, uh, members of the UX team. Yes, we have a UX team, <laughs> and Scott runs it. Right, Scott? I do, yeah. All right. Um, and he does a lot more. Uh, our QA and docs, and so everyone in R&D, um, but also you guys, so the community. Uh, the feedback from you, the alpha, the beta testers, um, the independent contributors to, to Side Effects Labs, our own staff that's part of Side Effects Labs, and they are really awesome. I can't imagine so few people doing so much so quickly. Um, and then let me mention the marketing team because they don't usually get the dues. They make things like this happen, and it happens you know, seamlessly for us. We just get to stand here and show off the stuff that we've done. It's fun for us, but they carry a lot of the effort to put us here. So I really want to call on Paula, Fiana, Bill, and Chris. You guys rock. All right, so thank you, everyone. Enjoy Houdini 19.5. Good night.